Welcome to the Heidi Thorne Show. I'm your host, Heidi Thorne, and in this podcast, I share my real world self publishing and small business experience with you. So let's get started with today's show. Now, if you've been following my show for any length of time, you know that I don't do a lot of guest interviews. And when I do, it's someone really special. So I am going to uh, introduce you to Lauren Darnell. She goes by at Try Hard Writer on TikTok and Instagram. And in fact, I met her on TikTok. And yeah, I'm a boomer. And so, <laughs> so yes, I am on TikTok. And uh, so I really um, enjoyed all of her posts and it was so much fun. And we got on a TikTok live and she started talking about her crowdfunding project for her latest self-published book. Now, a couple years ago, I did a video on crowdfunding, whether it was a crazy or creative idea. And at that time, I was just seeing a lot of really lame campaigns. <laughs> uh, so it's evolved a little bit in those couple years. And uh, it's so nice to see someone who has done it successfully. So that's why I was so excited to have Lauren on the show today. And uh, before we get started, welcome Lauren. And why don't you give us the two minute drill about who you are and uh, you know what the kind of writing you do and, and all that good stuff. <laughs> Hi, yeah, okay, uh, I'm Lauren Darnell. Um, I do mostly kid lit, so I do uh, YA, young adult, as well as picture books. I've written 11 picture books, but this is the first one that I've had published, um, that I've self-published, and, um, and then I do like a lot of flash fiction. I also write novellas underneath a pen name, um, so, that's my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know you have a lot more in your life, than, but, but that's yeah. the writing stuff, the writing that's life writing that you stuff. got. <laughs> and, you know, we were uh, talking about the, you know, the past that I've seen some of these really, you know, failed campaigns uh, that were for crowdfunding. A lot of them were very self-serving and I, I just really didn't know what they were trying to accomplish other than to have somebody pay for everything. You know, they weren't really doing it very strategically. Um, so tell us about that crowdfunding campaign and uh, why you decided to go that route. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, like I said, this is my 11th picture book that I've written. It's called The Day It Rained Iguanas. And um, for six and a half, almost seven years before that, I did try the traditional publishing route. Because I write picture books, it's particularly difficult to get published traditionally um, if you were not also an illustrator. Author illustrators have, just read, just authors have a heck of a time getting into traditional publishing um, because they don't, picture books don't particularly make a ton of money. Um, even if they end up on a bestsellers list, even if they sell thousands of copies, they are not selling thousands of copies at the same price as novels do. They now you can have things like Llama Llama and stuff turn into like Netflix series and stuff, but most likely you did not write the next Llama Llama and Pete the Cat. Um, and then, you know, so there's, there's a lot of struggles there in that they're more expensive to produce also because they are full color and they are larger. Right. Um, and then your audience turns over very quickly. And more importantly, um, everybody thinks they have a picture book idea. Oh, don't, right? don't even get me started on that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> like every person that I meet and I tell them that I write children's books, they're like, oh, I have the best idea for a picture book. And I'm like, I'm sure you do. Um, but one of the agencies or one of the uh, presses that I talked to that called me because they told me no, even though they really love my idea. And actually, I have a whole stack of, oh, my gosh, we really love this book, but we absolutely cannot market it. Uh, papers um, called and explained to me. They were just like, listen, they're like, we get tens of thousands of picture book submissions every single year. And they're like, and approximately, and this is just like a little insider tip for you if you're writing one and watching this, approximately 80% of those are Christmas books. They don't want them. Stop wow. sending them in. Huh, interesting. Everybody is still reading uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas and Velveteen Bear. So right. stop sending in your picture book submissions for Christmas books. They don't want them. Oh, um, wow. I haven't written any of those. All of mine are very STEM related. They're all very um, science-based. But so I went the self-publishing route because in 
approximately the last five years, it's definitely become more affordable. Um, and I went Kickstarter specifically versus GoFundMe or something like that, um, Indiegogo, anything like that, um, because Kickstarter does a lot of promotion within their own site. Yeah. Approximately 36% of my sales came from Kickstarter. Uh -huh. um, people finding me on that website um, because on my very first day, I got featured on the projects that we love page. Yeah, that, that was very cool, right? And I so saw I hit, that. Yeah. yeah. So I hit the home page the very first day, and uh -huh. so that that helped me quite a bit. Um, but and then I also went Kickstarter because uh, a lot of people get really like nervous around it because it is an all or nothing thing. Right. Um, it, Kickstarter is if you do not get all of your funding, you do not get any of the money. Um, that doesn't matter if you were $1 short, you will not get any of it. Um, the important thing whenever you start something like this is to make sure that the money that you're asking for is very realistic. Right. Um, there were other picture books that launched alongside mine that also hit the um, projects that we love page, uh, but because they were asking for $20,000. Yes, ma'am. To produce a picture book, um, they did not fund. They got approximately the same amount as me. I ended up with $5,600 at the end, which was uh, almost like right at $1,000 over my goal. And uh, the way that, I don't know if you want me talking this long, I'm sorry, but. No, no keep going. You got the expertise. I'm going to let you talk. <laughs> whenever, whenever you set that goal, um, what you need to do is really crunch the numbers. So the majority of what I was raising for, because I could absolutely afford to print the book on my own, it is not as expensive as it used to be, um, but I'm not an illustrator. And so the majority of the funds that I was raising for was to pay an illustrator. I needed $2,800 to pay my illustrator out essentially. And um, because I am a mom and because I am uh, just like an indie writer, I did not have an additional $2,800 laying around and banks don't like to loan for that type of thing. So uh, I knew that I had a really good idea. I knew that it was something that people absolutely loved and um, I just went for it. But whenever you go to figure out how much money you need, it's your cost, so any just like labor costs that you have. So you need to figure out how much your printing is going to cost, how much any of those bonuses on your tier are going to be, because if you do not account for those, like I offered stickers and uh, bookmarks, if you do not add that into your total, you will be paying for it out of pocket. Absolutely. Um, and so you, and that will just eat into your profit on the back end. Right. Um, and the whole reason that I went with this is because, and one of the things you have to keep in mind is you were talking about there are a lot of failed projects. Right. Um, there right. are a lot of people on there who did not have an author platform, who did not have a following, who tried to launch. And even though they had really good ideas, they failed. One of the things that you need to keep in mind is you need to have approximately 40% of the people that you need to fund. So I figured out that if I sold my book for $15 and everybody only came in and did the minimum, uh, did the minimum donation, which is not actually a donation, it's a buy-in. Right. But so did, did the minimum tier, which is $15, that I would need 300 people. Now, odds are that people will, will buy more. And actually, my most um, popular tier were the $25 ones and the $60 ones. Okay. So I did not need as many people. But I, I knew that I had to have at least 40% of those 300 people following me that I knew would buy the book right. before I launched it or it would absolutely fail. So if you're looking for $20,000 and you think, oh, I need $15 from each person to make this book, you need to realistically <laughs> Do you have at least 40% of those people following you willing to buy that book? Right, right, right. I know that. It, I think that's the worst thing. And you were talking about the, the I, what I like to call swag, because I used to be in the promotional products business, the t-shirts, the mugs, you know, all the little bonuses that you give to the person uh, who, fun, you know, actually helps fund you. And I was seeing things where they were, you know, they were charging $50, $60 for a really kind of nothing book and then they were giving him a t-shirt and a mug and I'm like 
the dollars were just adding up. And I said, how can you do this? It, you, this is going nowhere. And it went nowhere, you know, yeah. and, and that's the reason why, you know, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Wow. You, and while you might be really excited to have your, your book on a t-shirt and your book on a mug and your book on a bumper sticker and stuff like that, you have to think like realistically, do you know whenever you go to a wedding and people give you a cozy that has like the bride and the groom and whatever, and you're like, oh, this is really cute. I'm never going to use this. It's going into a drawer. Never. You do, never. You, do wanna, you do not want to put your money into anything that people will not use because you are throwing away ad revenue. Right. Right. So you want to do things that like I did bookmarks because people will pick them up and stick them into their book right. and then carry them around and other people will see them they'll lay them around i did stickers because they might put them on their backpack they might put them on a laptop something like that right. and people like stickers people like bookmarks and they are not a lot of money to produce mm -hmm. and in fact my illustrator is part of the 2800 dollars. she also did all of my promotional images Oh. And she also did, yeah, so she, and then she also did, like, the sticker designs and the bookmark designs. Wow. Um, that's, yeah. That's nice. And stickers, I mean, just given the audience for your book or the readers for your book, even though the actual buyer is the parent or grandparent yes. or whatever, I mean, kids love stickers, you know? I mean, that's been since I was a little kid, you know, everybody loves stickers, you know? And so I think that's a really good tie-in with what, you were doing so you would did it definitely thoughtfully <laughs> for sure and the one thing i know we were kind of briefly talking about and it's a little off of our agenda here but you were talking about the buyers for your book and yes. tell me a little bit about that because i know you said you were surprised at who was actually coming on into your book or interested in your book <laughs> Yeah, so whenever I started, before I launched my uh, program, I before I launched my campaign, I looked at all of the people who supported me on my various platforms, um, who was following me because I write KidLit and stuff like that, and I found that the majority of the people um, that like followed me and stuff did fall between like the 30 to 60 age range. Now, what I assumed is that because I write kidlet, I assumed that the people who would buy from me would be parents. So people approximately my age, I have a preschooler. So between like the, uh, like the 25 and like 40 age range, because I assumed that parents of preschoolers or parents of young children would be the ones buying my book. But what I found whenever I launched it, and that's who I hit really hard with my target um, advertisements and stuff like that, and where I was placing them. But what I found out is the majority of the people who bought my book, I think approximately 80% of the people who bought my book were over 60. They were grandparents who were buying the book. And so <laughs> after that first week, and um, we did $1,000 on our first day. So wow. we did... Yeah. So we did. Thank you. We did a quarter of what we needed on the very first day, um, which was really nice. And we were completely funded before week two. And then at the end of that, we were over almost right at a thousand dollars over. Yeah. So that's successful. <laughs> that is very, very successful. Yeah. And so I got, a, I got a lot of really good first day data that helped me like realign, like where I had put those uh, advertisements. I started like as Kickstarter does. And that's the reason that I like Kickstarter so much more than GoFundMe and stuff is there is a lot of tools on that website. It can be very overwhelming whenever you first open it up and you're trying to figure it out and you're really scared to touch things because you don't know if it's going to launch. They make sure they triple, double, quadruple, check like you're ready to launch it will happen on this day it will not happen until you touch this button and then once you touch it it's just like are you sure like there's a pop-up window it's like you're ready to do this because you have exactly 30 days nice. and technically you can set it for anywhere between 30 days and 60 days okay um, my suggestion is to go with the 30 days because a lot of what will happen is you will get a big boom at the beginning and a big boom at the end because at the beginning, people are your, especially your, it will be your first supporters. The people who are already in your fan base will hit that first because you will have had done at least two weeks of marketing lead up. I did, um, I did a seven day countdown with uh, my mascot, who was Verde the Green Iguana from the book. 
Um, I did like a lot of promo shots with him that were like countdowns that were very, very cute. And it got people really excited all the way down to the minute. And I'm talking the moment I launched, I had 10 sales immediately. And my very first sale was for a hundred dollars. So um, you will have already done that. So uh, by the time that you launch, you will have that big boom at the beginning, and then you will usually have a stretch where you will only have a couple of things trickling in, and then at the very end, you will have another boom. Because what happens is the people who want to support you will look at their bank account and be like, I have 28 days. Right. I have 13 days. <laughs> seven days like it's fine and then at the end they'll go oh shoot i have five days oh shoot i have two days right exactly i got a lot of donations on my very last day and i got a lot of comments on my very last day asking when it would be available for pre-order later because they didn't have the money then but they absolutely wanted the book so, so. Now your your book is available on amazon for for purchase or how are you uh handling no, not it? yet because uh it took longer to get the money from kickstarter than i anticipated okay they said that it would take two weeks and it took up it took two weeks for them to collect from everybody that backed sure. me um but then it took another almost two weeks for me to get it through my bank and so okay. just because it jostled my timeline a tiny bit um, before I put it up on Amazon, because we only did spot illustrations whenever I launched mine. Okay. Um, so my cover was not yet done. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people who self-publish um, like novellas and stuff like that. You will buy the cover beforehand. It's right. very often what right. happens. Right. But right. Um, this one, I just, I didn't put the money into the cover yet. I put right. it in spot illustrations so that people could see what the book would look like as they turned the pages. Sure, sure, definitely, definitely. And so, yeah. uh, I literally got my illustrator paid yesterday. And so the first thing she's working on right now is the cover so I can put it up on Amazon for pre-order. Awesome. But it will in September. Oh, okay, great, great. Yeah, because, you know, and I think that's realistic. You know, I, I think one of the things that as, as a self-published and, and a traditional, you've been in the traditional publishing world too, is you don't realize how much time everything takes. You know, I mean, like the Kickstarter campaign seems like it's going like super fast. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden there's this like long period of time for production and money and logistics and stuff. And in fact, let's, I know we, we had talked about, uh, talking about the logistics, taxes, sales taxes, uh, all those other uh, administrative kind of headaches and heartaches that uh, you might encounter uh, while you're doing this kind of thing. Maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit more about some of those details uh, for those who are actually considering this type of campaign as well. Sure. Yeah. So Kickstarter, which is what I used, um, builds in the taxes for you. You oh. give Yes. That's really good. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's part of what you fund for. But they they take your exact location, your exact city, and everything. Um, you have to put in all of that information for them to verify you, and they give you the exact amount of taxes of sales tax that you will have to pay, and they pay it. Okay. Um, which is was something that was very uh, appealing to me because I didn't want to have to figure that out. Oh no. Um, if we're being honest, I didn't want to have to figure it out. Nope. Um, which if you do, um. GoFundMe for sure. I'm not 100% sure on Indiegogo. Um, that's something that you have to figure out on your own. But uh, and then one of the things that was the most challenging or uh, intimidating for me was figuring out shipping costs because yeah. and so what I ended up landing on was no international shipping for uh, my Kickstarter. Um, and that was because I was able to use, because my book will be small enough, um, I, we're doing an eight by eight, and so it will fit into a media mail sleeve, and then all of the, all of the promotional items that I did will also fit in media mail sleeves, such as stickers and bookmarks, and they are very flat rate to ship, so it will be um, $2.25 to $3, depending on how far they have to go, and because nobody in uh, Hawaii or Alaska ordered, um, <laughs> they will be on the lower and uh, um, so that was the thing that I was the most apprehensive to try to figure out. And in the end, I couldn't figure out international shipping. So I just had to skip it for this. Um, yeah. Whenever I launch on Amazon and on smaller like book sites and stuff, then uh, we will offer it. But I just couldn't figure it out for this. Right. And, and usually once you're once you're in the Amazon universe, you know, uh, they handle a lot of that yeah. back end 
taxation and shipping and all those things that you know are out of your kind of out of your hands you know um and so that's why you know i i definitely you know like you've talked about here going with well-established platforms such as you know the the kickstarter or you know kindle direct publishing all of those things who have all that logistics figured out <laughs> is yeah. uh is is absolutely critical and and that's why i i, I tell a lot of self published authors they say well i just want to i just want to sell it on my website i'm like oh what are you what are you thinking you know i mean it's like then you have to do with paypal and then you have to understand taxation and then you have and, and I was in the promotional products business and a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just a mug or whatever. Oh, that doesn't seem very heavy. Yeah, but then you have like dimensional weight and then it's, you know, the shipping always freaked out my clients. I mean, they were just floored by how much stuff costs to ship. And so I, and, and because I didn't want to deal with like, I would get a, a lot of um, inquiries from Canada you know, uh, for promotional stuff. And I, I can't do Canada because then I have to get involved in the general sales tax over there. And then I have to report it over there. I mean, and with the, you know, the Supreme Court ruling on um, the Wayfair case where everybody is basically, you know, responsible for taxation now, it gets, it's really nuts. So that's why I'm, I'm glad to hear about your experience there where they handled a lot of those those issues and of course you know uh, the funding you get is also income you know so yes. you have to really talk to your cpa and, and i don't know if you have any other uh, insight on on that uh about how that works <laughs> no no i don't this these are technically my first book sales uh, a lot of the stuff that i have written has been for um contests and things of the like. I did a lot of flash fiction for a really long time. And like I said, I kind of dragged my feet in traditional publishing for a very long time. I did conferences and phone calls and meetings and whatever for people to tell me that they really liked my stuff. Um, but particularly for picture books, again, um, it's very hard to not sell, to sell people who are not author illustrators. And it's very difficult to sell to Scholastic if you're not a teacher. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. And I know that was another thing I think we had chatted about. Um, and maybe you want to, because I have, I have a lot of people, I do a lot of women's networking, and a lot of women, because they, they're parents and they work with kids, they all have the idea that I want to write a kid's book, you know? <laughs> and maybe you can kind of uh, give us a little insight into that whole school kind of uh, environment as well. Yeah, so um, Scholastic is the number one um, seller and purchaser of books. So uh, anytime that you go towards traditional publishing, that is who your agent and who your editor will be thinking of because um, they are the ones who go through with Scholastic books fairs and stuff like that. They hit all of the schools and stuff like that. So you have to appease them. Um, because Scholastic was started by teachers, they very much like to acquire teachers, librarians, um, people of that merit uh, first. And then um, because I write a lot of science-based books, a lot of mine are very STEM-based, uh, although they're really fun and light. Um, usually at the back end of mine, I have an index that explains like the real world phenomenons happening behind it and stuff like that, which is always things that I found very interesting as a kid. Um, I ran into a lot of problems of people saying that they absolutely love the book, they love the idea, but unfortunately because I am not an animal expert and because I am not a zookeeper and because I am not I don't have a degree in biology. Um, they would find it very hard to sell me as a person, even though they really liked my book. Wow. And the thing that you have to think about in traditional, yeah. In traditional publishing, you are not selling a product quite as much as you were selling like yourself as a whole. Right. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, being a parent isn't, is almost never the criteria that they're looking for. And in fact, I have a very good friend um, by the name of, David Goodner, who wrote the Jenny Goblin series, um, which are wonderfully creative books. They're so, so funny. Um, he has, uh, Jenny Goblin cannot open this box, and Jenny Goblin cannot have a monster for a pet. They are hysterical. They make my kid actually belly laugh. And uh, he is not a parent, but he's a librarian. And um, so that went a long way for him. And then just whenever he started, 
in traditional publishing from the time that his book got picked up like by a publishing press and like getting ready to like print like to sell took two years wow oh easily easily yeah. you know and, it, and it, everybody it I, I think, done, yeah but I they think, kept the date because they were like well uh before school will be better well around halloween will be better well now we have other stuff coming out that's too halloweeny together so now we're going to push you again so wow yeah, no, that, that, that whole process is so long, you know, because there's so many steps and people involved in each step. And I don't think people realize that. I think because they get, they get into this instant gratification thing. And if you're doing Kindle Direct Publishing, you know, you have your manuscript done, you know, it can be live within like three days, you know. So I think people get kind of confused as to you know all the steps that are involved, whether whether you're going the traditional route like you've done, um, or done the self-publishing Kickstarter campaign, it, it's it's a lot of work, and it's and you have to allow for time. So yeah. um, I think that's one of the logistics things that uh, people just don't understand either. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think what else we um, we had on our agenda here. Uh, oh, okay. Now here's the big question. If you had to do it again, would you do it again? And if you did it again, what would you do differently or better? <laughs> yeah, I I would absolutely do it again. Um, even if I didn't quite need the money to help make my goal, um, I would do it again because I got a lot of sales and I got a lot of drive and interest from people I would have never reached on my own um, through Kickstarter. It was really good. and. I, especially during this time, right, I was, I launched my book campaign in March. I had been planning it since December. And so I was very, very apprehensive to launch it because my first thought was, well, I know a lot of people are out of work. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And I was, I was very, very apprehensive. I had, but I knew if I didn't launch it in March, I would not get it done this year and I would not get it done in time for back to school, which is the season that I'm trying to hit. And so I would have to wait until next year. And so um, I weighed my options and I had to really think hard about, I'm like, well, I'm not trying to raise a lot of money. Mm -mm. And so um, like, I think it's still really doable and I launched it and what I found out and if, if anybody listening is having to, if you've been thinking about it and you've been setting it up and then you got really scared off by uh, the pandemic um, launching this, um, the launch of Kickstarters has gone down by 30%. Oh. Oh. But the funding has stayed the same. The same amount of people oh. and the same amount of money is being spent on the website. Interesting. But now there are fewer projects on the website for people to pick from. Uh, uh, they just, <laughs> yeah, uh, Todd McFarlane just relaunched the Spawn comic series. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, on there and, um, Todd McFarlane is using Kickstarter and, um, he asked for a hundred thousand dollars and in 30 days he raised like 3.2 million. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. And so you probably don't have the audience like he does oh, no. um, if you're looking, but people are still spending money on the website. There are just fewer, uh, there are fewer campaigns coming up. And because there are fewer campaigns coming up, like I sat on like the rising stars, like mm -hmm. bar and the upcoming and the new arrivals probably longer than I normally would have, which was really beneficial for me. But even not launching it at this time, I would definitely do it again, just for the exposure. They do a lot of free advertising for you, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have a very good idea. Wow, that that is really, really interesting. And uh, I know I launched a, a, a short book on, you know, like networking for authors. And I, I, I was doing it at about the same time that you were doing the campaign. You know, I oh. launched it in February <laughs> and it's on networking, which of course is completely upended. <laughs> but I said, yeah. you know what, what the heck it's done. I'm just going to launch it in my expectation. And I set my, reset my expectations as well. Yeah. So 
So, but yeah, I think I think that really points to the fact that you you have to weigh all of these options as you're looking for whatever self-publishing campaign you're, you're doing, whether it's a Kickstarter or on your own, um, you have to wait, you have to treat it like a business. And you definitely did. You, you looked at all of these details that a lot of authors that I talk to don't have a clue about. So, you know, kudos to you for, for doing it right and, and for the successful Thank campaign. Yes. And for those of you uh, in the audience who want to know, we're gonna ask Lauren to tell us where to find her on online? Uh, what's the best way they can they can reach you, Lauren? Um, if you're looking for me anywhere at all, Try Hard Writer is the best way to find me. Um, if you Google that, I am the only thing that comes up. Um, please don't mess with my domains. Um, but if you Google me, that is the only thing that comes up for my TikTok, my Instagram. Um, I will come up with Facebook pages, even though uh, I'm technically Lauren Darnell author page on Facebook, but even writing Try Hard Writer, because that's what's connected to all of my short and my flash fictions, that is what will come up. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, that's, like I said, I met you on TikTok and, and you know, and I loved all, because I was watching you with all the little mascot videos that you were doing pre-campaign and, and they were so cute, you know, and so, uh, so yeah, so you did well with that too. But thank you so much for joining me today. And this has been wonderful and enlightening for me, of course. And uh, so I will be sharing this uh, with everyone. And if you like information like this, this important information, Please subscribe to The Heidi Thorne Show on whatever podcast platform you like to uh, listen to podcasts on. I'm on Apple Podcast and Spotify and Stitcher and Google Podcast and Podbean. And if you like the video better, you just have to subscribe to my Heidi Thorne YouTube channel. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you again next week.